Hi, my name is Aaron, and today we're going to talk about the IEMA T9 Mini Amplifier. Mini. It's in very small, as in, I could just put it in the palm of my hand if I didn't have it all plugged up. Now, if you're re watching this review, there's a good chance you've already seen two great videos about this from two of my favorite YouTubers. One being Randy from Cheap Audio Man, who raved about how great this product was. The other from, uh, from Sean with Zero Fidelity, who gave a buyer beware. Um, in regards to buying this T9. I actually purchased mine after watching Randy's video and as soon as it shipped I saw Sean's video with the buyer beware and I was like no crap uh, I bought something bad um, but I've been hanging out with this for a couple weeks now and mine isn't as bad as Sean's um, but I don't know that it's as great as Randy's so I think we're gonna kind of fall a little bit in the middle here. Um, I always try to kind of keep these videos short sweet and to the point but I think this one may run a little bit long today because I'm actually going to really try to get in and show you guys um, how this amplifier works because it's really kind of weird. It has a lot of quirks and I'm going to go through each of them and uh, you know show you exactly what you're going to get for $150. Um, I'm also going to compare it to the Cambridge AXA 25 amplifier that I have here as well. Um, that Cambridge runs about $300. The T9 is 150 shipped, I think. Um, and so if you're somebody that's just getting into wanting to buy an amplifier and those prices are kind of close together, um, I'm gonna kind of compare the sound and then uh, kind of explain the differences between the two amplifiers. That may help you make a better decision if you're uh, interested in buying you know, a new amplifier. So let me grab the camera. I'm gonna get up close with the T9. I'm gonna show you the things I like, the things I don't like, and then we'll come back and talk about um, how it sounds against the Cambridge AXA 25. Okay, first thing I wanted to point out about with the T9 was that the assembly was really easy. Um, the two tubes came um, packaged separately in the box and they're the same tube. So you can just plug them in on either side, doesn't matter. You don't have to know like one goes in the other. They both go in either slot and uh, you know they're tubes so they only fit in one way so if you're new to tubes and worried about how to know how to insert them you know you can only fit them in the one way and they go in either one so you really can't screw that up um, this Bluetooth antenna was uh, shipped separately and um, it was really easy just to to screw on so I wanted to point out that when I first set it up I was just ready to go right it's like all right I'm ready and I'm like feeling around there's no power switch uh, I'm looking up here, there's no power switch. I'm like, how do I turn this thing on? Because, you know, I'm not going to read the instructions. That's just a little amplifier. It should just be easy to get. Well, uh, I, so I went looking for the remote, figured, man, do you have to use a remote to turn this on? And the answer is no. You can turn it on, um, you know, without the remote. But it took me a minute, and I finally looked at the instructions and figured it out. And to turn it on, you just press that button. Yeah, easy enough. Uh, and then to change the inputs, you just, oh, it kind of wants to move on me here, so let's see this. Just push it, push it, push it, right? Back up the Bluetooth, and then on our RCA. So that's how you change uh, the inputs if you're not using the remote. Um, you also have bass and treble knob, and I didn't use those while listening to this, I just kept them in the middle. But uh, I did adjust the bass when I was messing around with it, and uh, it did both the bass and the treble. Uh, you know, did change the sound uh, considerably. Um, and then lastly, to power it off, hold the button down for a little bit and it powers off. Um, again, that's all if you don't want to use the remote and I'll explain why you might not want to use the remote here in a few minutes. Um, okay, so that's basically everything on the front. Uh, let me uh, turn it around. I'll show you everything on the back. Okay, so here's the back of the unit as I mentioned earlier. Here's your antenna for your built-in uh, Bluetooth. Um, you're able to power one set of passive speakers with uh, these connectors here. Then we're basically looking at your outputs, which are four outputs. You've got the an RCA output here, you've got a coaxial cable here, optical cable, PC USB, and then of course you've got your power supply down there. Now you're also able to use this aux out, which is a 3.5 millimeter size to power headphones, a subwoofer, and IEMA even says you can use it to connect to another amplifier. 
I'm not a 2.1 guy, so I didn't, I don't even have a subwoofer, so I didn't power up a subwoofer to it, so I can't speak to how that sounded. And uh, honestly, I didn't even bother putting headphones to it. Um, and I definitely didn't use it with another amplifier because I just wanted to hear just how this sounded in general. Um, so that's the back. Um, you've got your four inputs there. Um, I think it's worth noting that this RCA input, um, you know, there's no phono stage on this little guy here. So if you want to run phono, you know, you're going to need to have a preamp, right? Um, because if you, or you could have a turntable with a built-in preamp if you wanted to use this for, with a turntable. So just note that, you know, if you've got a turntable and you don't have a preamp or it doesn't have a built-in preamp and you run it into here, you're, you're not going to get the, uh, any sound from the T9. So keep that in mind if you're considering buying this to use with a turntable. I forgot to mention, I think it's worth mentioning, that the tubes supplied uh, with the T9 are uh, two 6K4 tubes. And uh, according to IEMA, you can substitute those with KJ1, KJ2, GE5654, KJ3, KJ4, KJ5, and KAK, or excuse me, 6AK5. Now, in the like pamphlet that I read on this, it said that, it said et cetera after the tubes. Um, I don't roll tubes enough to know what et cetera means. So I, I, uh, I don't have the experience to be able to figure out, you know, just what else might be able to fit in there. But if you're interested, those are the, those are the tubes that you could substitute um, if you didn't want to use the supplied two. Okay, let's talk about some of the quirks with the T9 because it is quirky. Quirky. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people make this complaint, and if you've read any of the reviews, this is what they're talking about. When you power the unit on, it clicks. As you change each output, it clicks and then it clicks again. I think that drives a lot of people nuts. <laughs> Honestly, after a couple of weeks, I didn't even really notice it, but it's almost like as you change the input, it makes a noise to tell you that it's changing. Then it makes another noise, almost like it confirming that it made the change. It's, it's kind of really very strange. Um, now, if you've seen Sean from Zero Fidelity's video, his like just constantly clicks. Oh, weird how mine did that. <laughs> it just constantly is clicking. I really think he got a defective unit and it's just broken. And that's why his was doing that. I've left this on for a whole day just to see if it would do it. And I haven't had any any of that constant clicking issue. So I, I think his buyer beware video is accurate for his unit because it just was defective. Now here's the other thing. Um, according to IEMA's instructions, if you do not provide a signal, um, Within 10 seconds, uh, the T9 will click off as if it's powering down. That's probably what it just did a minute ago. It doesn't shut itself off. Um, the IEM instructions actually says it just goes to sleep. Good night, buddy. Just goes to sleep. Um, so what that means is then when you send a signal back to it, it's gonna click again to confirm that I got the signal and then it just, it's just a lot of noising, uh, noises. It's just a lot of clicking. And if clicking drives you crazy, that's definitely something that, you know, you'll want to know before purchasing this. Okay, so after a couple weeks use the clicking, I just got used to it. But here's what I cannot get used to, and that is this IR sensor here for the remote control. <laughs> it's just not selective enough. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, here's the remote for the unit, right? Pretty standard, that's fine. However, oh, let's say I wanna turn my television on. Crap. By the way, my TV just came on, All right? And that went off. Okay, if I wanna turn my TV off, sometimes it turns this back on, right? So <laughs> here's another thing. When I was using the, um, when I have my CD player working um, and I would use IEMA's remote control, <laughs> it would completely just jack up the song playing. Like 
it would skip to like the last song or something it just was all over the place and it, it does not gel so if you buy this unit <laughs> understand that the remote is very sensitive to other remotes and you're either going to need to put this in a spot that is way far away from any other gear or else you're just going to have to deal with it being a pain and that pain is kind of what i've dealt with i have found myself constantly having to turn this on off because my tv goes on or off it's just it's kind of been annoying so um just note that that this remote control <laughs> yeah it, it the unit and the remote they're just not um it's just not selective enough is what i was saying um or really exclusive enough for this ir sensor it picks up plenty other remote controls and messes with uh messes with the functionality okay so we've talked about the two main things that drive me crazy on this which is the clicking and the remote control but i think there's two other things that you should know before you buy this and we've already covered one which is that there is no uh internal phono stage so you're going to either need a external phono preamp or have a turntable with a preamp built in covered that uh, the second thing is this is a class d amplifier and when you look at the listing on amazon it says 100 watts like near the end 100 watts and i was like well that's interesting 100 watts well after doing further research um it's 100 watts into four ohms right and it's 50 watts into eight ohms so if you're uh, if you have eight ohm speakers which a lot of us do and you're thinking you're going to get 100 watts that's not the case. It's really just uh, 50 watts into eight ohms. I didn't have any trouble powering my speakers with this. I'm not a big power guy. I've had, you know, easy time using this AXA25, which is only 25 watts per channel. But if you, uh, but if you buy this thinking you're getting 100 watts and you're only using eight ohm speakers, um, you know, I could see how you could kind of get tricked by that listing. So just keep that in mind before you buy. Okay, real quick, let's talk about couple things that I liked about the T9. The first was that the Bluetooth was really easy to get up and running. Um, some units when you buy with internal Bluetooth, it's like a pain to get connected. I had no problem streaming to this easily, like took no time at all. So that was good. Um, interestingly, the there's a feel to the volume knob, which I like. It doesn't click. For some reason, everything else clicks. This doesn't click, uh, you know, which is a user preference there. But I like it when you kind of have some feeling, a little bit of tension there. The Cambridge knob here is just sort of like this. Woo, am I changing the volume? I don't know. So I like that uh, about the IEMA. The other thing is that this has a really long power cord. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure there's uh, an audiophile reason why uh, long power cords are bad. But in this case, I thought it was pretty good because you're probably going to use this like in a desktop or something like that. And to be able to run it really far uh, was really, really helpful for me. And, uh, you know, I've definitely bought other pieces of gear with a smaller power cord. Again, there may be like an audio, there's probably an audio reason why you want a smaller uh, power cord. But I enjoyed having along with this one. One other thing I forgot to mention is that IEMA included in the box uh, this uh USB to PC cable in case you were to need it. Um, so those are uh, kind of a few quick utility things. Um, let's talk about how it sounds next. Okay, so the big question is how does it sound? <sighs> Let me be honest with you, I was kind of surprised. <laughs> That's like the quickest word I could think of. A friend of mine asked me, I posted a photo of this and they were like, how does that thing sound? I was like, I was actually surprised. It sounds pretty big. I mean, for $150, I just assumed that it just wouldn't be that good, you know? But, um, you know, it it handled pretty much everything I threw at it. Um, I played a Chick Corea live CD through it. It's recorded in like a small jazz club and you could really hear like the applause. I don't know, it just kind of felt like it was coming around due to a kind of a fairly decent soundstage with the T9. Um, I played metal really loud through it, like with Mastodon, and it handled that. It handled hip hop fine. Um, I threw on some, you know, uh, I played a Thundercat track called Uh Huh, or Uh Uh, which is, um, 
it's just like this crazy like insane fast bass playing and it was really able to handle you know the definition on the bass notes fine now vinyl playback sounded great but i don't really know if that's a fair comparison because i'm running a 400 dollar preamp into a 150 dollar amplifier not to mention my stylus is a at audio technica shibata stylus which was 200 dollars. so that's 600 dollars of gear going into a $150 amp. So does that affect this performance? Probably. Um, and I just didn't feel like finding just like a cheap old turntable to run into this, which is what somebody might use, you know, with a built-in preamp or something like that. So I do think mine's probably gonna sound better than somebody who just has a beginner unit, but you know, it it handled the, the playback, uh, the vinyl playback fine. I, I listened to uh, the acoustic sounds reissue John Coltrane's uh, A Love Supreme, and you know, it, it sounded great, it handled it. Um, I also played a uh, sort of like a, uh, a, a, a digital, uh, sort of like sound effect for this with like ping pong balls. <laughs> I don't know, like, and they bounce back and forth between the channels and they have different noises. You know, like when you drop ping pong balls, like, bop, 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 like the sound changes. And again, this handled it fine. Like I could hear it going back and forth between the speakers it wasn't kind of all muddy. So <laughs> I was just generally surprised. Now, if somebody comes to me and go, I want to buy this tube amp, you know, is it going to sound as good as a $5,000 tube amplifier or a tube preamp? The answer is no, no way. This is, you know, these tubes are probably more acting like as a buffer, you know, and not like as a traditional tube amplifier. Again, this is a class D amplifier, right? So, um, so don't buy this thinking you're getting a great deal on a tube amp that would normally cost you, you know, anywhere from a thousand dollars more. Like that's not really the goal of this. Um, but if you just kind of want something that's, that's fun, definitely fun to look at, you know, and, uh, and something that, you know, you, you know, you're just powering kind of your regular set of speakers. Like I was generally surprised with how this sounds. And I think that goes back to, you know, the other videos that have, been made about this like Randy was surprised and even Sean was surprised when his worked at how well it sounded and that's how I felt once I plugged it in and um, it just you know it impressed me now let's talk a little bit about how it sounded compared to my Cambridge amplifier and uh, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up the video explaining uh, if it's something that I think you should buy all right Lord have mercy what is going on here <laughs> Okay, so I thought it'd be fun to be able to set up two amplifiers and switch back and forth between them. And what's funny is I bought this one little bit, little bear. I did some research and I was like, how can I find two amplifiers? Like how can I find a switch that I could buy so I could just switch back and forth to him? And I found this one little bear switch here. And then like immediately after I bought it, uh, I saw that uh, Randy from Cheap Audio Man had made a video about it, so. <laughs> I may make a video on just how to set this up because it was kind of interesting how it all worked. Um, but I was like, oh, okay, cool. So everybody's going to just think I'm probably making a video uh, not only about the T9 like Randy did, but also now about the one little bear switch like Randy did. But anyway, I promise I'm trying not to totally copy his uh, channel here. I just thought it was funny that, uh, that you know, that I bought that and he had made a video about it. But anyway, the... This does actually help kind of go back and forth uh, between the two amps. And before you ask, yes, I hooked this up individually to them and did not notice any sort of like, you know, um, any sort of interference in the sound. Like it didn't make things sound worse by inserting this switch into the chain. Um, so here's what I did. All right. <laughs> I have the Cambridge AXA 25 here and then the T9 there, and they're both going into the switch. And then I hooked up this DVD CD player to the T9. And then I have the Cambridge AXC35 CD player going into uh, the Cambridge amp, okay? Uh, and then I'm able to switch back and forth uh, and listen and see how things sound. Now, I thought, well, what the heck am I gonna listen to? Like, how, how is this gonna work? Well, turns out <laughs> I had two copies of The Endless River by CD by uh, Pink Floyd don't ask why I have two copies of it, but it did. So I inserted them both, hit pause, let them both time themselves right, hit play, and they were both running almost identical, right? And then as they're playing, I would switch back and forth between the two CD players and the amplifiers. Um, I thought it just might be better to use a CD uh, player than just Bluetooth. 
and uh, that's how I was able to do it and here's what I have to tell you they sounded pretty much the same <laughs> now the reason why I sort of react that way is because it took a lot to hook this little guy up so I was expecting like some like oh this is gonna be so awesome like this is gonna be I'm gonna be able to hear these great differences between either this is gonna be horrible or the Cambridge is gonna sound bad like ah and guess what it sounded pretty much the same and I even compensated for the watt difference right so and by volume so I tried to make sure that they pretty much had the same volume so I wouldn't think you know I the T9 is 50 watts the AXC or the AXA 25 is 25 watts so I did everything I could to make sure that the volume wouldn't just sort of throw me off and made sure the volume was as close as possible and again like I said the it sounded pretty much the same um, now I don't know what that says about the T9 if that probably says more about the T9 than the than the, the, the than the Cambridge but I think what it means is that if you're deciding between two of these and you're just going on sound alone, there's really not going to be that big of a difference. What you're probably going to be more interested in is the differences on the functionalities and the options that come with it. So, for instance, um, the Cambridge has, you know, four RCA inputs that you can use and it doesn't have built in Bluetooth and it doesn't come with a remote. Uh, and the T9, as we went through earlier, has uh, built-in Bluetooth and it's got uh, you know a larger selection of inputs digital at least but only one RCA input um, and it does come with a remote whether or not I really like it or not is sort of a different uh, well you know how I feel about the remote by now but at least it comes with a remote and the Cambridge doesn't also the T9 is $150 shipped and the Cambridge is listed $299 on Amazon so I don't know, probably 330 340 by the time it's shipped to you so now the only thing I will say is that you know, kind of what I'm going to end the video with is the difference between sort of the durability between the T9 and the Cambridge and warranties and those sorts of things that might come more into play. But again, when I just plugged them both in to the switch and went back and forth listening to the CD, I was sort of like, actually I was sort of let down because I was like, I just thought that this was going to have such a big difference. And I think that this will be great when I'm comparing other amps going forward. Like I really do and other speakers because I have two sets of speakers. <laughs> but in this first initial test, I was just sort of like, oh man, like they sound very similar. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's the comparison with the Cambridge. Um, let me wrap this up and just kind of explain to you who I think this would be a good unit for and if we think we should buy one. Okay, so if you've managed to hang in this long, I warned you, it'd probably be a long video. Um, you're probably thinking, Sh would I recommend someone buy the T9? And this is what I was saying earlier about Randy's video versus Sean's video. Um, you know, I think uh, Randy's excitement about the T9 at $150 is dead on. It really is like exciting for that price. It's surprising and you're thinking like, this is really probably too good to be true. Then when you see Sean's video where it's broken, it makes me think maybe it is too good to be true. And that's the main thing I want to focus on with the T9. You know, it's made in China, it's $150. I honestly think that this could arrive at your doorstep working. It could arrive not working. It could break in a day or two. I don't know. I just can't speak to the durability of this. Now, the you know, the chassis is like a metal chassis. I mean, it feels like, you know, a properly built unit. But I think when the first wave of these came out, there were like these weird quirks where, the, where it would just shut itself off when playing. And I think that they don't really do that much quality control when sort of making these at, the, at that price point. And what do we expect at $150? Like, where would that be built in to be able to do the quality control? And so I think that they probably quickly fixed that issue and then sent out another set and then people didn't have that one. But then they may have another issue and they fix that and send that out. And so who knows, this may in a week or two come, you know, start having an issue that I'm no longer able to use it. Um, I, so, you know, that's what makes it hard to recommend buying this. At $150, if you're someone like me that likes to gamble and just go, I don't know, this could be awesome, it could be awful. If that's you, then I do think this would be a fun thing to buy and play around with. But if you're someone that's really putting all their hard-earned money into getting a starter amplifier, I would probably say keep saving your money and buy something, you know, maybe closer to a Cambridge AXA, you know, 25 that's or 35 that's maybe three to five hundred dollars, 
with a better warranty because if anything goes wrong there they're just gonna probably send you a new one now there's a good chance if this goes wrong i can probably amazon may swap it out i don't even i forget like what the warranty is on that but i doubt i don't know that iema has uh you know a warranty direct with them so if i were to suggest if let me put it this way if somebody wants to buy this for you know sound and they just want something cheap and you know that that they can plug into easily and just start playing music i mean i i probably would say hey buy this as long as you don't mind the weird clicking noises the odd remote it doesn't have a phono uh preamp like those are kind of the three main things right and the power is 50 watts not 100 watts um as long as you're cool with that and know that then you know sure give it a go that actually i think that there's sort of like a group of people that this uh a group of buyers that this may be perfect for like my sons who are about to go to college this could be a cool little amp for their dorm room, right? Just this and a couple of uh, passive speakers, you know, like they're off and running, right? They can stream to it. They can hook up anything else if they wanted to, if they had the room for that. A dorm room would be great for that. If you just have a small desktop system, and I'm actually thinking about taking this to my uh, office at work and using it there, right? And just getting a couple, uh, just getting a pair of speakers. And because I think this would sound better than, it's obviously gonna sound better than just running off my inexpensive computer speakers that I have there. Um, if you have like a real small office at your house, this might be good for it. If you just got, or maybe even a small bedroom and you just want a real quick and easy, um, you know, amplifier to have in there. Like that's kind of what I would suggest for this. If you have no amplifiers, amplifications, receivers, if you have no gear and you're just starting out, I would be a little hesitant to suggest this just in case something were to go weird with it and it no longer work and I can't speak to the warranty. There, like I said earlier, I would suggest that you maybe spend about double and get something with a better warranty that you think is probably going to last a little bit longer. So that's it. Went through everything. Like, like I said, this thing's got a lot of quirks. I kept thinking about how to make this video short and sweet and I just really couldn't figure out how to do it. So if you're someone like me that likes just buying fun little pieces of gear that I don't, may or may not work, it sounds ridiculous to say. Like, I don't know. I might I might spend $150 on something that might not work. That sounds like fun. Uh, that's, a, that's a weird thing to say. But I said it. Um, you know, if you're someone like that that, uh, you know, wants to gamble with a T9, I say go for it. You'll probably be surprised at how it sounds. Um, but if you're someone that's looking for you know, durability and a good warranty and, and something that you know is going to last for many, many, many years, definitely consider, you know, saving your money and, uh, you know, and buying something else, you know, like a, a Cambridge or, a, you know, a Denon, you know, there's so many other great, you know, um, integrated amplifiers out there that if you spend a little bit more, it's going to give you a lot of great features with a good warranty. That's probably something that I would recommend at the time. But I've had fun with this. Who knows? In two weeks, I may post a video that says the whole thing blew up and it no longer works. I don't know. Two years, I may still have it. That's just the fun of owning the IEMA T9. Anyway, if you like this video, press the like button. It's only going to go around to other people that uh, may be interested in gear, records, other things that I talk about. But most importantly, if you've made it this far, this long video, thanks for watching.